So welcome to the Franklinton Historical Society. This is the last meeting of the year, so thanks for coming out on such a dreary evening. But we do have a special speaker tonight, so I can certainly understand your enthusiasm. I've been pretty excited about this program for a little while now. Um, always good to have living history versus, you know, after that, right? We are going to uh, have an introduction. Mr. Dorian will chat for however long he feels like it. And then we'll have some questions and answers or some comments for people who are his contemporaries in the audience. You know who you are. And then the Franklinton Historical Society has a gift of appreciation. Then Sandy Andromeda, the president of Franklinton Historical Society, has some announcements. Does anyone have questions before we get into the meat of the program? Going. Going. Cool. All right. So um, I am just going to hand the microphone off to the Honorable Julia Dorian, Mr. Dorian's daughter. She's going to do a quick introduction, and then he will tell us what he wants us to know. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rebecca and the Franklinton Historical Society for inviting us out here tonight, and for all of you for coming on a rainy night. We appreciate that. Um, Rebecca was kind enough to refer to me as honorable, but... Uh, for longer than I've been known as Honorable on the Court of Appeals, I've been known as the auditor's daughter. <laughs> and I am very proud to be the auditor's daughter. So um, I'm Julia Dorian. I'm the eldest of Hugh and Janice Dorian's four children. And along with my two sisters and my brother, we are very blessed and very proud to call this guy dad. Um, so I'm very happy to be here tonight and to hear your stories tonight. Um, my dad, I was born in 1965, and a year later, my dad became the city treasurer for the city of Columbus and served in that capacity for three years before he became the city auditor of the city of Columbus and has held that position uh, to current day. Um, so all of my memories um, of my dad and his career are of him being in Columbus City Hall. Uh, many of you know that he uh, goes to Tommy's Diner for lunch <laughs> almost every day. And before uh, they closed, he could be seen frequently at the Florentine or at uh, Phillips Coney Island. And I like to say that he goes home for lunch every day because <laughs> he is the son of Franklinton and he loves this community. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say tonight. So I don't think I need that. Okay. You know, in my role, I need some defenses, so I like to stand behind the <laughs> chair a while. Hey, first of all, th Rebecca and Bruce, thanks for the invitation. I really am delighted to be here. And I see so many familiar faces. One guy in particular who, over all these years, has, has still kept me unindicted is City Attorney Rick Pfeiffer. Rick, <laughs> thanks for coming. I also see some really dear, dear friends who I haven't seen in some time. There's one guy out here in the audience who, in 1954, <laughs> talked me into joining the Army with him. Lon Icaboni back there. <laughs> now, if, if Lon told you the story, he'd say I was the one that talked him in, but it, it was a good decision at the time. Well, I think most of you know I know the neighborhood. I, I don't feel strange down here at all. And uh, just to maybe go back over a little bit of history, you know, I'm the son of two immigrants. When you hear so much about immigrants today, as Dewey, my dear friend Dewey Stokes, knows that because he knew my mom and dad. Uh, my mother, they were not married when they came to this country. My mother came through Ellis Island in 1920, and my father actually came in through Canada. They met each other in Pittsburgh because all immigrants, even like today, were looking for jobs. And my dad was out of work in Pittsburgh. They married in Pittsburgh, out of work in Pittsburgh, found a job in Wheeling, West Virginia, where I was born, and out of work in Wheeling, and then found a job. How many people remember David Davies' packing house? Okay. That's where my dad worked. And uh, uh, I w I'm seventh out of eight kids. My dear mother used to say she had seven snakes, all born in Wheeling, and one buckeye born in Columbus, Ohio, <laughs> right across the street, as a matter of fact. And when Julia told you uh, Janice and I had four children, they also were born across the street here. So we've got lots and lots of ties to uh, Franklinton. And you know that when I was growing up, 
you know what we called it, the bottoms, right? And I think, Sandy, if we go back into the literature, all the way back into Lucas Sullivan days, you'll see that reference, the bottoms. Because as you know, B, this is the lowest topography in central Ohio. I'm glad to see at least one guy here much older than me, Wally Yohani. Thanks, Wally, <laughs> for showing up. But, uh, so we lived on at 740 Campbell Avenue. The house is no longer there. It's right across the street, or the alley as we called it, from Bellows Avenue School. And uh, we were flooded out in the January of 1959 flood. Um, my dad and I went to, moved in with my brother Mike, who had gone a little further north. My mother and uh, one sister went to live with another sister. Uh, we were out of the house for at least 30 days or more. And I know my, that sister and brother were glad to get rid of us after 30 days. But coming back into uh, Campbell Avenue, you know those properties. Uh, let me, can I say you older folks know those properties? They were very, very damaged, very much damaged. So we were only there for a short time and moved up uh, just a little bit from um, Riverside Hospital. Believe it or not, the address was 740 <laughs> Island Court. So it followed us around. In those days, how many people can remember Sandusky Street? Um, as, as a kid growing up, we'd walk to school uh, up Sandusky Street to Holy Family Grade School, uh, Holy Family Church. That was my church. And um, uh, of course, the Good Sisters of Mercy uh, taught us, Dewey and I, and everyone else at Holy Family Grade School. Uh, after uh, grade school, I went out to St. Charles High School. Well, how can a kid from the bottoms, eight kids in the family, get the Holy Family from Holy Family to St. Charles? Same way George did. We won scholarships. <laughs> so tell your kids to do their homework and pay attention in school. It, it, it works. Uh, so after St. Charles, uh, I went two quarters, along with Lon Icaboni, see him grin on his face back there, two quarters to Ohio State. Didn't know what we wanted to do. You know, we, we weren't at the top of the list, but we were not at the bottom of the list. So we came up with this brilliant idea, said, let's join the Army. So we went down to the draft board, the, uh, the old federal building, and said, can you put our names at the head of the list? And they accommodated <laughs> us. <laughs> About 30 days later, we were gone. About 30 <laughs> days went along. We went in on what was called the buddy system join with your buddy and you're supposed to remain together. So they sent Lon uh, to Panama and sent me to Germany. So that was, <laughs> that, that was, I don't, we never saw each other after that until we both, both got home and so forth. Well, thank goodness the GI Bill was in effect at the time. And when I got out of uh, the Army, uh, I went back to Ohio State and went the rest of the way through uh, on the GI Bill. Now, hold on to your seats, because I'm going to tell you what tuition was at Ohio State University. <laughs> Ready for this? Per quarter, $90. Wow. That's right. Remember, Wally? $90 a quarter. And I was living at home, sponging off my dear mom and dad, and things were good. Things were good. <laughs> So after getting out of college, I went to work with a national CPA firm and became a CPA. Was with them for about six, six and a half years and had a lapse of sanity, some folks say, and decided to run for public office. Well, I first ran for city auditor in 1965 and got my ears pinned back pretty good. And you know, there were only two or three people that helped a brand new kid on the block uh, to run for office. And one of those three is sitting right there, Dewey Stokes, who has been a friend forever and will be a friend forever. Well, I then was offered and I finally took that job as city treasurer. But I said no two or three times. And this is a true story, what I tell you. I got a call from Mayor Sensenbrenner. And it went something like, darn, I want you to get up here to see me. <laughs> well, young man getting a call from the mayor, I said, yes, sir. <laughs> So I went to see Mayor Sensenbrenner, and I always remember what he said to me. 
He didn't say, Dorian, I want you to get on my political team. He didn't say, Dorian, I want you to go out and help me raise money or help me do this or that. He said to me, he said, Dorian, what you should remember is that when you are called, you should serve. <laughs> this is exact words. And then about three minutes, I'm saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, <laughs> and I took the job. And that was January of 1966. Dewey knows all those personalities that were around at the time. So then in um, uh, 1969, my predecessor city auditor died in office, John Price, do you remember? So I was elected to succeed him and have been running for elections ever since then. All together with the first one that I lost in a primary along the way, I've been in 15 elections and, um, you know, God's been good to me. He's been good to me. Uh, been good to me with uh, giving me Julia and her siblings and uh, my wife Janice. And uh, things have been good. Well, I think after 52 years, the end of this December will be 52 years, I've probably done enough damage and it's time to move on. Some folks say, what are your plans? What are you going to do? I don't really have any plans. My wife and I have 10 grandchildren. And I'm sure they're going to think of something for Grandpa to do, uh, which, I, which I will welcome. I want to say something, too, about, and I mean this very seriously. You all here in this audience, you're the, you're the people of God. You're the people that make a community. Work, pay your taxes, live good lives, be kind to each other. You're the soul of a community. We have several communities like that in Columbus. I obviously have a real fondness for right here in Franklinton. It's no accident that I spend so much time at Tommy's and Florentine before that, and one of these days Phillips will be back. But uh, with, with the emphasis on amateur, I, I've been an amateur historian on Columbus, and a large part of it right here. Uh, Mayor Sensenbrenner used to say that Lucas Sullivan and I grew up together. <laughs> well. I had to admit we, we lived in the same neighborhood <laughs> in considerably different times, but that's all part of that history and, uh, you know, growing up in Holy Family Church and Holy Family Grade School and so forth. Uh, in the vernacular, I guess you'd say it's been a good ride. It's been a good life. It's been a good career. I don't regret a single day of being in public service. You can call it politics, you can call it whatever you like. When you've got a dedication and a spirit for serving the community, there's no better place to be. And I thank God for these years that he's given me. And I thank all of you for being part of this community. And, you know, I look back there at George and Lana, I mean, these friendships, you never lose. You never lose. And those are some of the real, real blessings that I've gotten. Friends that George, Lon, Dewey, you know, God love you. You'll always be in my heart, even if you talk me into the army again. But <laughs> I don't, we both need a lot of waivers today if they talk to you. Uh, <laughs> so at the end of the year, uh, December 31st, I'll be retiring. And uh, my successor will be a young woman named Megan Kilgore. I supported Megan during her campaign. She used to work with me for 11 or 12 years, then went out into private practice. She has her undergraduate degree from Ohio State and got a master's degree from Northwestern. So I like to say she knows her arithmetic. Well, I may not have been much of a genius, but I always felt I knew arithmetic. <laughs> and it has carried me a great deal. So, uh, hey, I'll be glad to entertain questions, do the best that I can. I'm too old to be embarrassed by any of your questions about politics and so forth. So, Rebecca? I do have a question. You okay. know, we have a calendar every year, same day, same time, same place. What were some of the memories that you have of some of the holidays, at maybe how you celebrated oh, at well. school or in your family? Well, obviously, Christmas was the big day of the year with uh, mom and dad and eight kids. Um, going to in those days midnight mass, uh, the Holy Family, and, and uh, other times also. I remember my dear mother, uh, two of the real, real uh, big events of a week were number one, going to church, and the other, going to bingo. <laughs> uh, I always remember that, you know. 
and the um, uh, uh, events like, you know, I think of West Broad Street, things like going to the Dixie Theater, which, what's the name of it now? Do they call them beanies? Is that well, the? Just sold it. As they sell it. It's another. It's another theater they're opening up in Life Theater. Yeah, they know. Yeah. Is that right? Well, that was the Dixie yeah. Theater, and then what was? Is that Lev's Pawn Shop? Is yeah, that the Avondale? 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 That was the Avondale. The theater Avondale. Was, yeah. And where this health center is down here uh, on West Broad Street. Um, when I was growing up, that was an A and P. Anybody remember A and P grocery yeah. stores? Yeah. And believe it or not, when A and P left, it became a Kroger. And when Kroger left, it became a car dealership. Then they do it. Temporary, yeah. BMW or whatever yeah. it was. And then they went to the candy. The candy, wasn't it a CVS store or something yeah. for a while? Anthony's. Anthony's. Anthony's, okay. So it's had lots and lots of tenants. But West Broad Street, of course, was the, the, the big economy in the bottoms and so forth. Sullivan Avenue was next, I guess. Um, Sullivan uh, gone through a lot of changes, right, <laughs> since those days. Uh, but I remember those places very, very well. And, um, anybody got any questions? I'll be do the, happy to do the best I can. Do you remember, I, I guess what I want to know is why you turned me down. I had a job opening for you, <laughs> and you... <laughs> You, in so many bad words, told me you know what you can do with that job. Do you remember where that was and why? Well, you were at the bank at the time, weren't you? Yeah, 41 years worth. Yeah, and uh, I, I'll tell you, I've enjoyed public service. There have been two or three offers came along the way over the years, but I enjoyed public service, and that's why I turned you down. Besides that, I didn't want to be a salesman. But, uh, but, uh, could you, could you talk a little bit about what Holy Family was like when you went to school there? For example, was the freeway crossing oh. into the playground? Did you have an asphalt playground? Did the boys and girls play on different sides of the playground? Absolutely. Did the, <laughs> what, could you talk more about the details of what that was well, like? Well, Holy Family School and Dewey, I was in the first, first grade of what was then the new grade school. Okay, a red brick building, two stories high, and they, it housed eight grades. Um, oh, the, the boys uh, were all on the north side of the school playground, which was asphalt, and the girls were on the south side, as I recall, Dewey, and that was asphalt. Um, we would march to uh, church uh, at least once a week, and you better be on your best behavior. And by the way, I had a, Dewey will remember, I had a dear sister, my, my sister Peg, who passed away last year, spent 70 years as a sister of mercy. Yes, wow. So for a short time, she was there at Holy Family, and she, she had to discipline Dewey a thousand times, I know, <laughs> over that time. But I had to be on my best behavior, obviously. Uh, but uh, Holy Family was the center of the community in those days. The high school course was there. Uh, thriving, it was a wonderful high school, Holy Family in those days. So many of those neighborhood high schools don't exist today. I mean, you can remember St. Mary's on the south side, Holy Rosary on the east side, Our Lady of Victory in the Grandview area. None of those high schools exist today. But Holy Family was the center of the community at that time. What, yes. did, what did you remember most about the 1959 flood? Well, I'll tell you, I told... Uh, one of your, your folks not too long ago. I was at Ohio State at the time. This was in January 59. Mm -hmm. I, was t I took the bus down High Street, and then I would have taken a bus over Sullivan Avenue in those days uh, to, and then walk from Sullivan Avenue down home, only a couple blocks away. I couldn't get a bus. The buses had stopped, and that was my first thought. What, something's, I know it, it was freezing cold, if you'll remember and raining, and then to top things off, the, the levee burst out around the, right around Central, just above Central Avenue uh, at the ho hospital. So I walked home from High Street, and, um, uh, you know, it was raining good, and the water was rising, but we didn't think that badly at that time. Well, it was the middle of the night. The middle of the night, I thought I heard something. I always remember this, a, a trickle of water. So I got up and walked downstairs, and there it was, the water. The, all the basements in those days were 100% full, you know, which had the furnaces and coal piles in those days and so forth. 
so, um, and the Army Ducks were starting to come down Campbell Avenue. Well, forgive me for saying I, but my mother was an invalid. My mother ultimately passed away from Parkinson's disease, but I carried her out of the house into a, another car. We could do it. My dad's car was parked on Green Street, and the water had already moved the back end of it onto the, onto the yard. Mm -hmm. So I uh, carried my mother into another car, and uh, we all piled in and uh, took uh, my mother to my sister's house. So we were out of the house for 30 days, and, you know, as much as I loved the neighborhood and so forth, the house really wasn't worth coming back to. It, those houses were. And, and you know what? We were the lucky ones. You look out at, at Chicago Avenue and Broad Street and those there in Princeton, you probably had, what, three or four feet of water, do we, yep. at that time? Avondale. Uh, Avondale, yeah. So those are some of my memories of... Uh, okay, yeah. I have a lot of pictures of the 1913 flood. The old house that we lived in was a two-story brick house through the second floor windows had a watermark <laughs> from the 1913 flood. And of course there are a lot of deaths and so forth at that time, but uh, 59, as bad as it was, didn't rival the 1913 flood at all. So you must have had a lot of water over where you were, uh, Wally, over where your company was, didn't you? Not that much. Not, Not that, that much? much. Yeah. Okay, you were lucky, so okay. Anyone else? Hugh, I got a, a, a mathematical question for you. Keep it easy, Walt. <laughs> now, everybody here pays taxes pretty much, and they're very happy the way you've administered <laughs> things here. And now I've known you put the hammer on some people about spending occasionally in the city. <laughs> we probably don't want to go into that. But <laughs> what would you say is the amount of... Uh, money that you're handling, what you're, uh, you're financing is the bond issues and people probably don't understand the astronomical amount of money that uh, you handle. Well, when you put it all together, you know, you hear about general fund. Fund, fund is a pocket that you account for certain things, police, fire, etc. And the water fund and the sewer fund, you put it all together, uh, we have about two billion dollars a year come in. And true to the nature of government, about two billion dollars a year going out. Okay, Columbus is special and unique among cities. Um, I'll mention a number that might frighten you, but I always say the number is not important. It the importance is how are you able to manage it. We have about 4.5 billion dollars of outstanding debt. It is all capital debt. We don't borrow money to pay the gas bill or pay employees. Two-thirds of that debt is for water and sewer. Remember, water and sewer with Columbus covers about 90% of Franklin County, not just the city of Columbus. It's the best example of regional government you'll ever find. Um, we pay our debts. We pay them on time. Columbus has what we call a triple-A bond rating, have had that since 1995. We've been through a mild recession in 2002 and 3, a deeper one in 2008 and 9, an early part of 2010. We've been able to maintain that, okay? And it takes, it takes a discipline to do that. Um, if you look at the uh, large, we, we track the largest 25 cities in America. There are five that have those AAA ratings. If I had talked to you three or four years ago, I would have said we're the only one. <laughs> but there have been a few others joined us. It, I'll tell you, it's, it's tough to, to keep that. Um, it's a challenge. We're drilled by rating agencies every year, every year. And uh, I guess I've been the spokesperson. I must have been saying the right thing all those times. Uh, but that's, that's it. Well, Bill, did you have a question? Yes, Mr. Dorian. I, uh, all the years in, in public service, you've been through quite a different category of mayors that's come through. Does any of the administrations stick out in your mind as one that you particularly cared more to work with than another? Well, I mentioned to you Mayor Sensenbrenner. I, I'm very, very fond of him. He will always yeah, be my number one guy. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I've served alongside of, because as you know, I'm independently elected, so I've never worked for a mayor or for a council. But uh, this is my sixth mayor that I've worked with. Uh, city attorneys, along with Mr. Pfeiffer, I think seven, I believe, Rick. And uh, when you think of city council members, something in the range of 45 or so council members over the years. But uh, Mayor Sensenbrenner will always be dear to me. But, um, Rebecca? I was just wondering more about Holy Family and getting back to the neighborhood. Who, was, who were the priests that you recall and who were your teachers? Because I know that a lot of people in the audience went to Holy Family before, during, and after, but I mean, Father our, entire family, <laughs> our entire family had the same teachers at Avondale. Uh, Father Gressel was the pastor of Holy Family all the time I was growing up, right, Dewey? And he was a wonderful, wonderful person, a wonderful priest, and, and a, absolutely a disciplinarian. I think you'd agree with that. <laughs> uh, all of my teachers through grade school were all Sisters of Mercy. And um, Sister Mary Melda was the eighth grade teacher. She also was a great disciplinarian. But uh, I remember them fondly, and as I said, all, all eight grades, the uh, uh, you didn't misbehave. You all know that. You remember those days. You didn't misbehave. Get on the wrong side, you got the ruler. <laughs> got the ruler now and then. Or the paddle. Or the paddle. <laughs> but those, Rebecca, those are some of my, my thoughts. And uh, when I went to St. Charles, when Lon and I were at St. Charles, um, with the exception of one or two people, they were all priests that um, taught us at St. Charles. And I fondly remember St. Charles. That, uh, Anything else, Rebecca? How about St. Mary's of the Springs? You remember that? I remember St. Mary's well. <laughs> it's, yes, it's right up Nelson Road. But, uh, and you know, I'll tell you, uh, you wouldn't do this today. But my father, after David Davies, David Davies went on a very long strike right after the war, Bill. And with a uh, wife and eight hungry kids at home who wanted to eat, my dad uh, left David Davies and he uh, got a very, very small grocery store out on the east side, out around Leonard and St. Clair Avenue. I used to walk from St. Charles down to Nelson Road and thumb <laughs> from Broad Street all the way up to Fifth Avenue and then thumb down Fifth Avenue and down Leonard Avenue to my dad's store. I don't want to thumb today. I, don't want to thumb today. But, uh, yeah. I know you and Dewey had some high adventures at the boys club. Could you tell us about a few of those? No. <laughs> well, you said we could ask anything. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you this, my, my, uh, someone mentioned the uh, freeway or the interbelt. There was no interbelt in my growing up days. I spent my entertaining uh, hours and so forth down at Sunshine Park, okay? And those were the days when the kids would go to Sunshine Park and your parents didn't have to worry about you and you didn't go home until you got hungry again, okay? Uh, some of you will remember Mel Dodge wonderful, wonderful leader. He was, that was his first job with the Recreation Department, was supervised, doing that right, first supervisor at Sunshine Park. Well, when I became city treasurer in City Hall, by that time, Mel Dodge was director of the Department of Parks and Recreation. So I thought I was very successful, and, do, and uh, Mel would come over to me every now and then and say, now, Huey, behave yourself. You watch yourself. <laughs> so I was always under the tutelage of Mel Dodge. He passed away a few years ago, but uh, wonderful, wonderful person. Sunshine Park was the, the hub of all playgrounds and entertainment in those days. And uh, the, uh, I've often said, this inner belt it had a great cost to our culture, to our community. Cost went far beyond the millions of dollars that it took to build it. And that was in the early 50s, as I recall, mid-50s. Uh, so uh, I don't like those thoughts of dividing up uh, the communities that way. But that's the way it was. That's the way it was. <coughs> yes, sir, Mr. Pfeiffer. Mr. Doran, could you tell us more about family life, your dad? supporting a wife and eight kids and how he was able to do it himself being an immigrant. How, 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 did, that, how did it all come together for you? How did he raise his family? 
hard work and a lot of prayer. Uh, I remember my dad, um, yeah, some of you fully remember these days. My dad worked 664 days out of the year. He wouldn't work on Christmas, you know, wouldn't work on Christmas. Uh, and that old grocery, I grew up in that grocery store. Uh, and all of, most of us kids grew up. The older ones were gone by that time, but most of us grew up there. It was persistence and uh, I got to say, a lot of hard work, a lot of hard work. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm not undermining or making light of the prayer factor. That was a daily routine in our house and uh, paid off, paid off. Uh, I remember if I uh, heard it once, I heard it many, many times. Uh, as young kids, my parents, especially my mother, would say, I want you kids to get every bit of education. My mother and dad never went past the sixth grade of school. Didn't have to over in the old country. We want you to get your education every bit you can. We want you to be prepared to work hard. When you get to an age where you're working, be prepared to work hard. And above all, don't lose your faith in God. I think that formula worked in 1920. My mother's first job, by the way, she was a maid to the Andrew Mellon family, the multi-billionaire bankers in Pittsburgh. She was a maid in their family. Uh, so if I have any financial wisdom, it had to start in the womb, I think. You know. uh, but I think that formula worked then, and I... I think it works today. Yeah. Rebecca? Yes, B, B. Murphy. Hey, hi. <laughs> uh, could you in, um, enlighten me on the West Side Jubilee? Tell me something about that. Well, I remember the West Side Jubilee. It was held at Sunshine Park in those days. Uh, Dewey, I want to say the first one was in the late 40s. Yeah, Dutch uh, Uncles started. Who started? The, the Dutch Uncles. Okay. Them the Dutch uncles. And I want to say it was like uh, my brother Mike was still in high school at the time, so I want to say it was like 47, 48, yeah. somewhere around that Probably, time. Yeah, 49, 50, somewhere around okay. there. That, that was a wonderful event. I mean, you, you know, carnival and uh, neighbors and so forth. And I don't ever, maybe there was, I don't ever remember any violence or unhappiness and so forth. Um, nobody knew they were poor. They, they all were, but they didn't know it. And they were happy for the most part. Um, you know, I said I was born in Wheeling, West Virginia. An awful lot of the bottoms in those days was Appalachian. A lot of people up from Kentucky, a lot of people from West Virginia and so forth. Uh, but worked well for us. My dad's being kind of shy about this, and I'll probably get in trouble for even saying this, but uh, I wanted to add something to City Attorney Pfeiffer's question. So um, a couple years ago, I went to visit Ellis Island, and that was where my grandmother came through Ellis Island um, from Ireland, and my grandfather came through Canada, and doing some research, we found out that he had been turned away a couple times yeah. coming through Canada, but then eventually came in. But when I was visiting Ellis Island, I stood in the middle of this grand receiving hall, um, and a thought came to my mind that, you know, what was she thinking the day that she stood in this receiving hall, and could she have known then um, what would come of her, her voyage from Ireland? Could she have known that she would have met my grandfather could she have known that she would have eight children, um, three of them nurses, uh -huh. one of them a Franklin County Commissioner, one of them a city auditor for 52 years, one of them a teacher, one of them who worked with my grandfather in his store for many, many years, who was married to the um, chief of the fire department here in Columbus, my Uncle Dick Ray Sadley. Yeah. And that was something that really struck me um, could she have known? And I know that she would be very proud, as would my grandfather, okay. of my dad and his siblings. When my dad came in through Canada, he, he, was, he wanted to cross the border into the United States. He was rejected twice because he did not have $200. 
and the immigration rule at the time was you had to have $200 so you wouldn't end up being a burden on the U.S. Treasury. And I don't think they were as much in debt then as they are now. <laughs> but he finally worked in uh, Canada through the wheat fields and so forth. So he saved up $200 and then made it across. So that, uh, Dad, would you, Rebecca, would like, would you name your brothers and sisters? Um, Oldest sister, Judy, who was a nurse, uh, graduated from uh, um, uh, the old St. Francis Hospital. Anybody remember St. Francis? Okay. And uh, she went through uh, nurses training based on the uh, Army Women's Corps. They paid the way, and then after graduating, she had to spend one year in veterans' uh, military hospitals. Okay. A second sister, Sister Mary Macrina, Peg. Uh, Peg uh, entered into the convent uh, just after. They wouldn't take you immediately out of high school. They said, go out and work for six months or nine months, see if you're still interested, which she was. So she had um, a college degree and then uh, two master's degrees after that and was ultimately head of the school of nursing at one of the hospitals. She just passed away last year. Uh, Judy died four or five years ago. Third daughter, Mary Polsonelli, a uh, graduate of Mount Carmel School of Nursing and was on the faculty there at Mount Carmel School of Nursing for some time. Today, her daughter is on the faculty there at Mount Carmel School of Nursing. Mary's still alive but retired. Then my brother Mike was next. Uh, Mike was county commissioner, a good friend of Dewey's, uh, for about 15 years. Uh, Mike died uh, 25 years ago. And I just have to tell you, Mike died of lung cancer, and he was a very heavy smoker uh, since he was that high. So <laughs> stop smoking. Uh, Sister Nora, who is still alive, uh, retired nurse. Uh, then the Sister Marge, uh, who is retired now, and was her husband was the fire chief of Columbus, uh, Ray Fadley, do you remember? And then I guess I came along after that uh, for whatever I've been worth. And then I have a younger brother, John, who is in an assisted living facility right now. But before this uh, evening ends, I want to emphasize to you all, when you have a friend, cherish them for life. And I want to say that, Lon, to you, Dewey, you've been my friends, and you will continue to be my friends. We'll throw you in there too, George. Okay. <laughs> but for a long, long time. So, Rebecca, that it? You didn't mention Posenelli was my cousin. Remember how many cousins I had? <laughs> thousands, <laughs> thousands, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was from the south, she was from the south end. Yeah, yeah, Hinman Avenue, Hinman. Right? Yeah, right. right. I didn't have the pleasure of growing up in Columbus. Uh, knowing the rich history that you've talked about, but I can tell you that f I could see faces here and appreciate your views about life, relationships, and success. But before you leave tonight, um, maybe not right this minute, but before you <laughs> end your session, tell us a little bit about your perspective for Franklinton as you see the years rolling ahead. I've been saying for several years recent years now that in my view Franklinton is the next boom area of Columbus and I mean that. I think we're starting to see evidence of it now. I mean let's face it Broad Street's kind of desolate in some parts and especially when you go out to the hill pretty desolate going out there. You're starting to see developers take uh, risks over on Rich Street where Wyler and Kelly and so forth. I think Franklinton, Franklinton is, is going to boom. I really do. We worry, and everybody, I think, uh, is unhappy to see Mount Carmel Hospital move out to Grove City. But, you know, the, the, the urgent care facility will still be there. The School of Nursing will still be there. And I think that's going to invigorate the area quite, very much, very much. Uh, so I, I'm very positive on, uh, on Franklinton. And uh, yeah. Thank you. What you doing, Bruce? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you. Come out, Hugh. Come out. <laughs> I wanna present you with some calendars. Oh uh, boy. And
And uh, you'll notice if, if you look at the th this is a, I didn't buy this truck. <laughs> I'd like to have it. Okay. But uh, in December, the year, when you're going to... Oh, boy. You're gonna, there, there you are. And this is your cat. <laughs> Bitsaw. Bitsaw, is that right? Bitsaw. Yeah, Bitsaw. Yeah. Lawn High School graduation picture. St. Charles. Yeah. 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 Miss Dorian can be, she's, she's the culprit there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Bruce. You're sure welcome. Thank you. And I would also like to, as historical society, we'd like to give this to you to put on your wall someplace. Okay. And you can remember some of these places. Oh boy. Yes, I surely do remember some of them. Yeah. This is a Vicki Burton uh, yeah. print of uh, Franklinton. Uh, I see. Different uh, venues in Franklinton. Hope I can get this by the Ethics Commission. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. You, yeah. you get it. Just don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about <laughs> okay. it. Sure. You want to do it like that? <laughs> but <laughs> do what you're told. Do what you're, I know. I've, I've been doing it for years. <laughs> I, I, get, I get to see Mr. Dorian. I, I've been going to the city council uh, yeah. for almost every Monday night, right, yeah. and uh, and I enjoy it. I, I think pretty crazy sometimes, but it's I enjoy crazy it. crazy sometimes. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> but, uh, can I? Well, I'll put that back in there. Right there. Let me get that. That it, Rebecca. Hey, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. And that concludes our formal program for the evening.